All right, folks, today I'm going to have a little chat here with Kyle Tully. Thanks for coming on. Hey. And we're going to be talking about historical martial arts. And um, I'm going to drop the bomb on him right away by asking him a pretty difficult question. Uh, what is your opinion on what constitutes an expert? It's something that a word that people throw around on the Internet kind of haphazardly. So one of the things that um, that we we get into whenever it comes to being an expert is uh, we don't specify what an expert is supposed to be. Like, are we supposed to have a person who is an expert in maybe academic knowledge? So like they can bring up sources, they can quote things, they can like put it into context or, you know, being able to look at this from a really research based orientation. Or are we talking like martial expertise? So like the application of like martial techniques and karate, there'd be the kata guy. And the kata guy would know all of the katas, bunkais, which are two man katas, and kumite, which are two to three man katas, which are fighting based. But they weren't that great of fighters. And mm -hmm. so we would say they were an expert at kata versus um, the guy over here who could whoop everyone and could apply that knowledge, possibly not even tell you the name of the techniques he was using, or at least their proper names, but he was our expert in fighting, so the application of the art. That also really applies to archaeology. You know, when, whenever archaeologists or, or historians, uh, <laughs> those are two different specializations to begin with. But if they talk about if scholars talk about how people fought, and mm -hmm. you know, versus somebody who practices it, the historian is going to know more about the historical context, about the equipment, about how people lived, et cetera, et cetera. The HEMA practitioner is going to be able to tell them more about how certain techniques apply, or at least how they interpret them. And mm -hmm. ideally, we'd bring that all together. When you use the term martial art, and you think of a spectrum where martial is on this part and art is on this one. We tend to make fun of the artists because like they're very form based. So like a person who's very good at doing like one of the blosses, like one of the I, I call them kata, like that you get out of one of the manuals, like, oh, do X, do Y, do Z, and then they can like do those performance or be able to like bring up information. They're over here where versus the martial is over here, and people will typically fall somewhere in that range. As somebody who sometimes overanalyzes uh, footage and whatnot, it can be easy for me to uh, kind of take something that's more on the art side of things and just kind of deliver a fairly harsh critique on the practical aspects of it, which is may not be the primary focus. And on the other hand, you can also have people who uh, really focus and practice more on the art part and then think they got the martial part nailed down with that, but they haven't tested it out in sparring and etc. all of this. In an ideal world, there would be a disclaimer for everything and people would actually read the disclaimer. I cannot in every video say, I don't consider myself an expert, I consider myself an enthusiast. Expertise mm -hmm. is kind of a different level, mastery is way a different level. Yeah, and one of the problems whenever people, like, if they see you perform something, so like I, uh, from a traditional martial arts point of view, if you watch somebody do maybe a kata, a bunkai, or like two man forms, one man form, or you see someone demonstrate a technique, their fluidity could give rise to the idea that this person is an expert at function of this, but they may be just very good at presenting the information. Mm -hmm. So I can watch something and it looks amazing, and maybe to the layman that's amazing, but as, as you are more studied in function, you start to be able to actually pick that apart and go, yeah, but a strike wasn't at the person, they kind of just fed that, look, the disarm that they're talking about, the person just let go of the weapon, mm -hmm. like you're able to pick up more on that. So when people are like, oh, I think this person's an expert because I saw them online do this wonderful, terrifying thing. It's like, yes, they did it online as a demonstration, which they can go back and refilm and edit. And they mm. probably have worked on demonstrating a hundred times. Tradition versus reconstruction. That, yep. That's another element of this. We're also expertise, of course, is highly questionable or, or up to interpretation. I always make the joke that HEMA is like um, the Tutenberg era um, Germans. They don't want a king. 
right? We don't want to <laughs> name anyone the high king uh, or the master of whatever because we're very anti um, titles. So, mm-hmm. like, especially in the states, like everyone's like, oh, no one's going to be over me, and when it comes to this, so, uh, and. You know, they have a right to that. And if someone wants to call themselves master, most of us are over here going like, "Mm -hmm, that's kind of a title given to a person, not one that you kind of assign to yourself. We, as being reconstructionists, because that's what we are, we're reconstructing a martial art, we have no idea what it would actually be like to have to apply this in lethal conditions. We have Mm -hmm. all, all the way up to like resistance, but we're never going to have the same context and know-how because our life doesn't depend on it. Yeah. And what people tend to forget is, even if you look at a, a long-standing martial art with a long tradition, uh, people tend to look at it as if it was a, a continuous tradition in the sense of they did the same thing over centuries, but they really didn't. There's always some sort of break. Like, no matter where you look, something happened. You know, even if it was just the Europeans come along with guns and change everything up. In China, for example, you know, for certain time periods, martial arts were banned and people had to incorporate techniques into forms to kind of hide them, the fact that they're practicing them. There's no such thing as a pure martial art either, because, like, if you look at martial arts, like, Historically, the best one I can point out is karate. Karate, a way of the empty hand and whatnot, is less than 100 years old historically. Um, it was called te, or um, I can't remember the term, but it, it basically meant either fist or Chinese fist. And so it was like Southern Shaolin temple boxing, but it was mixed with all sorts of other things, local wrestling. It always had its differences in these different areas. But then whenever people in the 50s onward, like codified it, it became rigid and then it became unuseful versus like all the way up until that point, they were constantly adapting and changing. So like when you see techniques over here, they're going to look like techniques over here because we live next to each other and we have trade and we have access to each other. Shogun Miyagi, uh, Sagichi Taguchi, Chris Pullman than me. So like there's Miyagi sensei, there's me in black belt line, right? Mm. And from here to here has been a massive amount of difference in how the art is practiced. We went from simple forms, less than five to 10 moves, very tall stances, not very low, to where you had to learn both punching, kicking, so striking, weapons, throwing, to now people are doing jump back, spinning backflips with aluminum swords. Mm. There's some level of reconstruction in most cases. Yeah. Maybe you can find machete fighting somewhere where there's you know people still defend themselves with a machete on the streets sometimes. That that could yeah. be, but that's probably the closest that you'll find. Right. And that like if you go to South America and you, you there is plenty of fights if people want to look them up online of people fighting in the streets with machetes. I have one that I usually tag in videos when people are making arguments about like, well, this these techniques are not not useful or whatnot. And it's mm. uh, the fight looks exactly like Hans Talhofer, where the guy has it back behind his shoulder. The other one's in a low guard and they move back and forth like that repeatedly. And it ends by the guy coming up, hitting the other guy in the hand. The other guy clips the other guy in the top of the head. But the guy hitting the hand loses his weapon and runs off. The other guy's like bleeding from the head but he's alive mm. and it was like if it would have been maybe a heavier sharper blade he probably would have had his hand on the ground just like the plates yeah speaking of the plates so the process of actually reconstructing it how would you like if you were to talk to somebody who wants to get into hema and they have no access to an instructor etc and they just got to go buy the manuscripts how would you tell them what advice would you give them how to go about it Besides, don't do it. <laughs> I put all the material searching in into different categories, but also to before you even get started on that is if I'm wanting to, let's say, study historical martial arts of some sort. Let's say I want to learn uh, Dusak. So that's going to I need to narrow my focus down to something because if you just study 
anything, you're going to get lost. You're chasing too many rabbits. You would want to narrow your focus down to what am I wanting to do? What is my expectations? Like I want to learn 16th century Dusak. The first thing you would do is you would read that material. So like if you've got Myers 1570, you know, Art of Combat book, you'd flip over to Dusak section and you read the whole thing. Okay. The reason you're reading it is you need to get used to the lexicon and to the grammar because every manual has a slightly different way that they speak. So you have to get used to the different words they use. You got to get used to the different terminology, how they say things. Checking out too many resources, you're going to get completely confused because they say, well, this is a Zwinger over here, but this is a Zwinger over here. And they look very different. And like, that's very confusing. So you need to narrow your focus down to like one resource for a little while. The first categories is to organize your material into things like guards. People online are like very much like, I don't need to know a guard because like all I have to do is know the attacks. Well, I'm like, the guards are the beginning and end point of t attacks. Mm -hmm. They're also the beginning and end point and sometimes even the in between of defenses as well. So with your sword, you are going to learn your basic strikes. Cool. You're going to put your sword up. You have to have a starting position. They're not just going to say, like, let the sword dangle anywhere. All right, cut. Cut it right over how. And it's like, okay, well, no one's going to let you just float the thing out there forever. They're going to want you to have a guard, and the guards are there because mechanically they give you some sort of advantage. Then you need to be able to move around in those. So the next thing would be, like, footwork. So that's one of the things that a lot of the manuals, whenever you're starting to research, that's are going to tell you about footwork. So that is going to be a, an area where either... You're going to have to find some more modern sources, so like like Olympic fencing or maybe some later sources. But you want to find something that can teach you how to move your feet effectively, because a lot of the earlier sources do not teach you how to do that. The so. basics generally are just not covered. How do you grip the sword? How do you you know mm -hmm. footwork, especially? I mean, you know, in for example, in Meyer, the way he describes how you step, you can kind of puzzle together what sort of step it is. Mm -hmm. But it can still be a little confusing sometimes. And uh, there, sometimes for the same way in which something is described, you can come up with two or three different ways in which it all makes sense. It's a mechanically effective. Which of those do they mean? Basically compare notes, you know, see what mm -hmm. interpretations other people have come up with, see right. what works well for you. Mm -hmm. As long as you don't, you know, practice it for half an hour and, and go, oh, this doesn't work. Yeah, it doesn't work because you don't, can't do it properly yet. Right. And one of the things also while you're doing research and is whenever you finally get to start applying it is, is that when you first start putting things together, um, I always suggest that everyone goes towards some of the later sources because they have imagery and images, yeah. of course, are going to speak way easier. Oh, I see the way this guy is here i see this okay now i have an idea of what i'm doing the earlier medieval artwork is pretty bad quite frankly like in the sense that they had certain conventions that you just need to know like for example they would not show you a sword edge on they will show mm -hmm. it the flat so what they're showing looks like whacking the opponent in the head with the flat but it's actually a cut and right. you need to know that, otherwise you'll come up with something completely different. In the Renaissance, they started to be really good with the artwork. It's much more detailed, and you can actually see how something is aligned and all of that. Yeah, and you can actually see, like, you can see what a guard looks like. You can see what a footwork work looks like. You can be able to see, like, where the transition of movement between things, because you can look at a guy's like, okay, he said in plate A, this guy should then look like plate C over here, who's like extended so you can, and there's diagrams on the floor. So you're mm -hmm. like, oh, so if we checkered floor, foot to here, they look like that, then we just move in that. And now we can go guard to footwork. And then like, once we have guards, we have footworks, then we work on striking. So now like right over how it's like, okay, so if I go, if I start here and I end here, then it's just a process of engineering either in the reverse or straight ahead. Like if I go from here to here, then I can actually start to put things together because I have the basic structure of the start, the end, what the footwork looks like and how the attack, okay, it's this part of the sword. It should end up right here. So I should either be able to go from this position to this position, or I should be able to go from this position to this position 
and that should teach me how I am supposed to strike. One of the things we've all struggled with wonderfully um, in the corona times is it's very easy to practice those first three because they're the basics. Like they're basically shadow boxing and kickboxing. Mm -hmm. I can move, I can strike, I can go to guards. But practicing against a defense requires another human being. There's no machine that we have made yet that can help us practice attacking into somebody's guard or binding and winding. So like that's something that if you're going to be studying, you have to be able to have a person because martial arts is always a two person art. Whenever somebody asks me, so how, how can I learn this by myself? I usually tell them you can learn cutting by yourself. You know, if, if you want to, yeah, sure. You can absolutely practice cutting mechanics. You can cut water bottles, tummy mats, etc. You You can become great at cutting. <laughs> That's only part of it. That's a separate skill, a skill that is ties directly into fighting, because mm -hmm. if you can't cut anything effectively, then being able to hit them does, doesn't do that much. Uh, but you need to be able to defend yourself and hit them. That's actually the primary thing. Uh, if, you, mm -hmm. if you don't have that, then it doesn't matter how well you can cut. There's the, that binding and that timing and all that that gets completely lost whenever I don't have somebody else's energy there. And so like if someone is going to get started, besides finding resources, besides narrowing your focus, besides organizing it, you have to have a dedicated person who's willing to work with you. Because if it's you doing it completely by yourself in your backyard, there's going to be a ceiling and it's going to be very quick to run into, which is, mm -hmm. which is sad. But at the same time, like it's a martial art, you're doing this to be able to do it with other people anyway. You're yeah. going to have to find someone. That's part of the appeal, you know, the community, you know, getting together with people with similar interests and, you know, figuring out what the manuscripts meant or trying to at least and connecting with it, with history and getting fun exercise and, Et cetera, et cetera. That's what it's all about. Yeah, because in, in, at the end of the day, we are a bunch of nerds swinging <laughs> swords and pretending that we are great at sword fighting because we want to have fun. I mean, like, mm -hmm. the, um, one of the martial arts I've studied, like the Filipino martial arts, almost died out because it wasn't fun because mm -hmm. uh, they wouldn't hit the stick. They'd hit people's hands and arms with their, their uh, kamagong or their ironwood sticks and whatnot. And like, it was brutal and people got hurt and people stopped wanting to do it. Mm -hmm. And so that art started to die out where other arts were like, hey, we're safer uh, and we're funner and um, you can have a long life in our art. We should be able to do it in a manner that is safe, but also a manner that is respectful to the sources and stays in that martial context. Because if it's gonna be a historical European martial art or a historical African martial art, or as long as it has the martial art aspect tied to it, it needs to keep the martial part because, you know, Tai Chi is wonderful, but it's an internal art. It is not a art for self-defense, even though some people will claim it is, and it might have been back in the day, but it is not that anymore. You can do all kinds of fun things like, um, You know, I've seen pr people practice with LARP swords who, you know, they, they still, they will consider techniques from different armed martial arts and they may also look at the, the manuscripts, etc., etc. They they are genuinely interested in, um, you know, figuring out sword fighting, but the focus is more on fun. And as long as they're aware of that and, and they're, they're just, okay, this, this is what we do, that's all good. Um, the problem that I've starts with whenever somebody is like, yeah, we know how sword fighting is. They haven't fought to the death. So, you know, you could argue nobody really is connects to that quote unquote primal origin of sword fighting as such, but we can strive to get close. We can try to do our best to make it as functional as possible to our, where our interpretations make sense and might not get us killed <laughs> yeah yeah that's the most important thing because like uh if people are dying people aren't going to be coming back um, <laughs> yeah unless you got a necromancer on call which if you do hit me up this was one of the, um, my favorite videos that came out recently um there's a aikido practitioner who's for the last couple of years has was questioning aikido because he's like we practice these techniques over and they're very religious on how they're done 
And then he's like, I want to apply this. And then he tried to apply it and he was like, I can't make it work. It's like, and people were in the community, like, you're just not doing it right. You need to practice more. He's like, I can't get this shit to work. I've been doing it for almost a decade. And it's like, I am trying it in every which way, but loose. And then it's like the difference between an art that has gone that route and an art, say like boxing, which has been around for a long, long time. And is actually in a way older than Aikido. It's Aikido is a formulation of art forms, uh, more modern than most ancient arts. So it's like <gasps> boxing spars, boxing spars often. Yeah. And the art is heavily based off of, we are going to apply this because if you look at boxing very simply, besides the guards, you got three techniques, <laughs> straight punches, hooks because hook 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 right and you have a helix punch that comes around things versus going straight that's all boxing is everything else is just application there's some people who win tournaments and they're just using like basic cuts they're just mm -hmm. really good about i faint and i hit the guy over here they're great about range management they're they don't even need very good defense because all they have to do is just keep the range with the other person their timing is amazing but then you have somebody over here afterwards, which I've been to tournaments where this happens. Someone's like, you're, you're garbage because you're not using any of this other stuff. And it's like, well, the person's winning. Yeah. So, I mean, proof's in the pudding. To say that your, your expertise is of a high enough caliber with Zornhow, you have to be able to use it consistently and under pressure against a resisting opponent who doesn't know it's coming. Mm -hmm. And the best places to do that is sparring against people who don't know you and going to competitions where no one wants to let you win. It does take quite a long time to develop your understanding and your practice of, a, of this technique far enough where you can actually consistently pull it off. If you can't pull it off in sparring, it probably needs more practice. Maybe your interpretation is a little off. So it does require I mean, at least more advanced stuff. You know, the basics you can absolutely you know, develop at a reasonably quick pace. Uh, the more advanced stuff takes a long time, but at the same time, this shouldn't be taken as a cop out because sometimes there's a bit of a tendency when, whenever you point out that this and that technique wouldn't work or does not work against a resisting opponent, there's always the argument, yeah, but you're not good enough. You're not doing it good, well enough. You're not doing well enough. So, okay, you've been doing it for 10 years. Not good enough. 20 years. Not good enough. 30 years. No, you need to study and practice your entire life you need to dedicate your life to this art um if it's if the skill ceiling is supposedly that high there's something off about it it's probably not being taught effectively or the technique is not as good as you think if it takes literally a lifetime to accomplish it it should be more accessible than that if you took george saint pierre and you taught him a ridiculous like he taught him tai chi right george st pierre because of his attributes could probably whoop somebody with tai chi hmm. okay? he's just naturally a gifted athlete mm -hmm. even with the deficits of what he's been taught he's still going to be able to make it work and if we go well look he won using that so that must be effective hmm. problem is like in mma leoto machida was like this karate black belt came off pulled off some sta stances people were like oh see karate works now and it's like well, there's, there's some aspects of it that he uses that are effective, but you don't see him doing what you see other practitioners doing. Sometimes the style is inefficient. Sometimes you're not using it in the correct timing. Do I use this in the before? Do I use it in the after? Mm -hmm. Is this simultaneous? And that's an aspect. Timing is re timing and distance management is one of the hardest things for people to learn that don't already have another martial art they've sparred right. a lot in. That's why like one of our mentalities, like we need to get the person sparring as soon as possible mm -hmm. because we put that person a beginner with an advanced person whose job is just help them learn how to attack so not be afraid to attack me and how to not be afraid to be attacked and what distance and whatnot and range management and timing and do it in a fun in competitive ways so where they're like oh i'm figuring stuff out things like physical fitness can compensate for somewhat dubious technique in some cases so you need to be aware of that like just because one person can make something work that's inherently flawed in terms of mechanics that in and of itself doesn't necessarily prove that this is good just like a person who can't uh, pull off a, a perfectly good technique 
that's also not really proof that this is garbage. That's, that's a whole, you know, it's a complex thing. Martial arts yeah. are complex. So, like my my original uh, karate instructor was able to pull off some magnificent things that looked completely ridiculous whenever you looked at them, like in a form or whatnot. Mm -hmm. But he was also six three and weighed two hundred and seventy five pounds and was like very strong and was willing to go a hundred percent at somebody who may not be expecting that. And it's like, mm. of course he can pull that off. Oh yeah. He, he stacked the deck fighting other people has to be a requirement. Can't call yourself a master. If you have never gotten outside of your pond. Yep. So and that's the good thing about like training nowadays. Like we are due to the internet and think, and actually one of the good things that come out of Corona, a lot of people sat down and they were like, let's just make some video content. And I mean, that was one of the main reasons why I wanted to start making DVDs was because I got tired of hearing people like having them show up to a competition. Like, Oh, I'm just practicing with me and my friend in the backyard. And I'm like, do you have anyone showing you anything? You're like, no. I was like, oh my God. And you're trying to interpret sources. I'm like, yeah. I was like, do you have any martial arts backgrounds? Like, no. I was like, we, we need something at least as a baseline for like people to get started. I remember when I, before I joined uh, Hima School, I, I just had to try it by myself because there was nothing in the area and, and we just get together and, and uh, practice. And we, we, we would do, we actually went the opposite way where we did too much sparring. Like we did, almost nothing but because that was the fun part and that's that's also a problem you, like you can't jump into sparring if you don't even know the basics if you don't really i mean okay you have a rough understanding of it but like if footwork is completely lacking you don't really fully grasp the technique then you're not really going to i mean you are going to make some improvements except things like timing distancing yeah, sure. There's always going to be some benefit in doing something, but just doing it completely from scratch is difficult, especially if you don't take the time to really, uh, you know, plow through the manuals and come up with technique drills to really, you know, get that into your system. You can hammer out a rough version of something, but it's hard to polish that whenever it's just you and the other person and this is all we know. And for y'all, it may work because within your group, even if it's like five to eight of y'all like hanging out and fighting all the time, but you're going to get used to each other's styles. Yeah. You got to interact with other people through like this or like going, getting in your car and driving or whatnot and visit other folks. And like, that's going to teach you a lot because every time I've gone to a competition, I feel like when I come back, I always have something new. Ask them like, how do you keep doing this? And most people are like, Oh, I'll, sh I'll show you. And like now the the, technology has spread through everyone else and now techniques are getting sharper and people are seeing some new ways of doing things and it just everyone got better one of the things i always like um complain about geisling shots or the one-handed shots of the leg mm -hmm. where you just pick it at them is like i've never seen anyone do a cutting demonstration with that right i would i would definitely like to see that it's like let me see what your edge alignment looks like when you whip it low like that and just from movement whoop, okay if you can cut a tatami that easily, it's like maybe we can rediscuss this. But a lot of times it's flat. A lot of times the edge alignment's way terrible. It can be difficult to judge what would be effective, what wouldn't, because we we don't actually cut each other to pieces. So that can be hard to figure out. Um, I mean, I tend to be kind of um, on the side of saying if you pull off a hit without endangering yourself that's worth something but how much is it worth exactly that that's where it gets a little tricky you know because if you if you landed a hit that in real combat wouldn't do much but you didn't you know you didn't trade hit the blow or anything you just landed something and were safe then okay death by a thousand cuts maybe but is that worth even just one point i don't know some people assign the hands as being one point <clears throat> versus like the head or the body that could the body could be like three and the head's like five but then you see people sticking their hands way out here they're like oh i'm in flu it's like no you're you're kind of just like dangling your hands out here oh if yeah it's just... me in the chest like <laughs> it's no big deal if they get hit because it's just one point right whereas in, in real combat if you get hit in the hand you're probably done 
Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, even like there's a reason why like the most common fencing glove that we all use in competition is a giant gauntlet with multiple levels of padding, and mm-hmm. it's so easy to get your hand damaged, especially by someone swinging a steel bar that's blunt. That is enough to disable your hands, which I've worked oil field and I've dropped shit on my hands before, and it's like your hand just automatically spazzes open yeah. under pain because it's trying to get away from whatever hurt it. Like mm-hmm. you're not going to do much after that. Even huh? a synthetic blade can can do quite a lot, can still break fingers and everything. And and even even if it just doesn't break anything, it's just that that immediate sharp pain that kind of On the one hand, it's pain. On the other hand, it's kind of uh, numb. It feels sort of paralyzed. And you just, you can't hold on to the sword anymore. And that's with a blunt blade. So sharp, it's just, yeah, goodbye fingers. That's it. I've been more injured by um, plastic swords than I have ever Mm. been injured by steel because someone, they picked it up. That's another artifact that is in our brain. Like, this is a toy because we're used to plastic Mm. toys. I can swing this as hard as I want. And it's just like, no, yeah. even the Rawlings ones, like those are the some of the worst I've ever been hurt by because it's like, we're in light gear and this person's just whipping. All right, before it gets too long, um, I'm just going to call it here and uh, see whatever I can edit it down to. Okay. So thank you, Kyle, for just hanging out and having a chat about this. And I'll leave a link down below to Kyle's Facebook page and some other things. So uh, check out the, the video, the, the, my review of his instructional material on Dagger. That's really good stuff. So definitely check that out. And if you're in Oklahoma around October, um, come to, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm not good at German, so Geslin Festen uh, 2021. We should be having it in October sometime. So we should be having a long sword tournament with as long as uh, the Corona stays at bay and everyone's nice and back. So yeah. Hopefully. We'll see how that goes. So thank you, Kyle. Thanks, everybody, for watching. And have a good one. Take care.